Welcome back to Rolling Solo, my name is Adam Smith, and in this game overview, we're going to be checking out Merchant's Cove from Final Frontier Games. If this is the first time you're checking out the channel, I hope that you'll subscribe as well as like this video and leave a comment down below as to whether or not you found this video helpful, and also check out our many different communities here on Patreon as well as Facebook and Discord. All those links will be down in the pinned comment. Would love to have you join the solo community there. The purpose of this video is to give those intrigued by Merchant's Cove that haven't actually given it a shot as of yet an idea as to what to expect from the game. We're going to go over the factions that are involved in the core box. We're also going to talk about the Peddler AI. Of course, the Secret Stash expansion, which is, in my opinion, a must purchase for solo players. We'll also touch on that as well. And you'll see here on the game table, I've already set up for a typical first or beginner playthrough in a solo capacity. Merchant's Cove is a highly asymmetrical Euro game where each player assumes the role of a different fantasy merchant with a unique shop. The merchants contend to sell their goods to the arriving adventurers at the Cove's Piers, the most famous markets in the Five Realms. Each player uses their own set of role-specific components and gameplay mechanisms to produce their goods, increase their shop's efficiency, and most importantly, get rich. Though the merchants work independently in their specialized shops, they compete against each other to attract customers, influence the demands for goods, and secure sponsorships from the four faction halls. To get an edge, merchants can employ local townsfolk to work in their shops as staff, or if they dare to cut corners, they can gain leverage from the corrupt layer of rogues, but at what cost? After three days of selling at the markets, the wealthiest merchant shall be declared the winner. When you begin set up for the very first time, of course you'll use the core rulebook to go through 1 to 12 of these steps in order to get the game to the table, and you can make some tweaks as you wish throughout. During step three of the setup, you're going to be tasked with choosing two sets of townsfolks. And inside the core box, you'll have locals, which are represented with an house icon up in the top right hand corner. You'll also, with the sword icon, have mercenaries or the anchor for sailors. It's recommended for your very first game that you use the locals and mercenaries and not the sailors. However, if you want to bump things up a little bit, go ahead and mix the sailors in. In step seven, you're going to choose a rogue card. You're going to place this up in its designated space, and you're going to place rogues as indicated in the top right hand corner into the layer, as well as placing a number of rogues into the draw bag as well. Now, what's important here in terms of choosing a rogue card is when your first game commences, it tells you to go ahead and use card number one, which is right here. It does not have any special ability that you have to deal with during gameplay, keeping things relatively light. However, if you go with some of these other ones, it is going to bump up how many rogues are in play, but then give you the ability to take corruption, as it indicates from the skull here on the bottom of the card, in order to gain some type of useful ability. For instance, you can actually gain a corruption card on a certain peer in order to have rogues be of any color you wish. Those are the major things during the core game setup that you can tweak and modify prior to beginning your game. Now we're going to talk about the peddler, which is the merchant you're going to be going up against when you're playing solo. Now, when it comes to setting up the peddler, you'll be following this booklet right here, which has the setup instructions right on it from one to five. There is one thing you'll be able to change within the core game that will actually bump up the difficulty. When putting together the 16 card peddler deck that you'll be drawing from for the peddler as the AI, it has 16 regular or normal difficulty cards, which I've got right here in this deck. And one card has started in position to the right. We'll talk more about the flow of the game later on. And up here we have four other cards, which if added into the 16 card deck that's here, these four are for the hard difficulty, as you'll see by the dumbbell in the center. You'll place those four cards, shuffling them into the peddler deck for a total of 20 cards, bumping things up a notch. 
Of course, you're going to want to set up your own merchant to control, and inside the core box there are four merchants to choose from, as well as three separate expansions that add the additional three merchants into the fray, giving you even more variability in terms of your choices, and each of them is going to be wildly different in terms of how they actually produce the goods they're trying to sell. So you can see here the Chronomancer is one of them, the Blacksmith is another, the Captain... And finally, the Alchemist. And the Alchemist is the one that I've set up here on the table, as you can see. Now, if you flip this booklet open on the inside, those five steps to get all of this content to the table and ready to go is inside. So that covers the gist of the setup. Of course, you're not seeing every single piece move into position, but the rule book itself, as well as these smaller booklets, do a great job of hand-holding you through the setup process and you will not be confused when setting this one up. It's also worth mentioning that if you have anything in the secret stash you wish to mix and match into the gameplay, we'll be talking about what that expansion adds for solo players at the end of the video. Right now, what I want to do is change my focus from a look at the setup to now the actual game structure. A game of Merchant's Cove is played over the course of three rounds, or days, and each round is divided into four phases. You have the Arrival Phase, the Production Phase, Market Phase, and Cleanup Phase. In the Arrival Phase, the first adventurers are going to set sail for Merchant's Cove. In the Production Phase, players produce goods, secure sponsorships, and manipulate adventurers to suit their aims. Of course, in the Market Phase, Phase, players are going to earn gold by selling the goods and receiving their sponsorship rewards. And in the cleanup phase, which is the final one, the boards are prepared for the following round. Scoring is done at the end of every single day and of course is kept track on the actual score track around the outside of the game board. If your game piece happens to wrap all the way around to 100 and past it, you then gain a gem to recognize the fact you've gained 100 and you continue on the track to the left. After three full rounds, which is three full days, there is a final scoring phase, and then the player who accumulated the most gold wins. In this case, when playing solo, you'll be testing yourself against the peddler. The arrival phase begins with going to the draw bag, which is this one right here, full of meeples of different varying colors and rogues based on that original rogue card you placed. And when you're drawing them out, you'll draw them and place them into each of these ships one by one, and you're placing two in each of the boats for the core game. During the arrival phase, it's important prior to drawing and placing meeples in the boats to take a look at your road card in the top left-hand corner. You'll see an icon here for a ship, which does match the arrival phase icon. Basically, if you see that and you happen to pull any rogues out of the bag, you're still going to place those rogues into the ships no problem at all. However, if you happen to have a rogue card in play like this one instead of the other one, and it has this icon in the top left-hand corner, what you're going to do is place all the rogues that you pull out of the bag to the side, continue to pull to the bag just customers. And customers are, of course, yellow, red, green, and blue. The rogues are gray. So basically what's going to happen is the rogues are not going to enter the boats when using this particular rogue card with that icon in the top left-hand corner. And then once all the boats are populated, those rogue meeples that you have sitting to the side that were not populated in the boat, they are going to go back into the draw bag. Next, you're going to turn your focus to the peddler booklet. And inside of it, you'll find an arrival phase section and it tells you to go ahead and pull a card off the top of the peddler deck and place it in the rightmost slot. This is a discard slot. This is your peddler deck. These two slots in the middle are what's really important to determine what the AI is doing next and what really matters as depicted by this bolt icon and the watermarked area in the middle is whatever's on this side of this card and this side of this card. However, we don't know what's going to be over here just yet, but we do know this. It gives you a little bit of insider information as to what the AI is up to in the near future. After that, you're going to grab the draw bag that you filled the boats with, and you're going to go ahead and pull meeples out until you fill all of the slots right here, all four of them that have this boat icon down below. 
And that is it for the arrival phase. Now we move into the production phase, and this is where the heart of the game really starts to begin. The production phase and the market phase are where you're gonna be actioning your particular merchant to accomplish certain goals that you're going after in order to get ready to sell goods during the market phase to all the customers that dock at the shoreline. So I'll be aiming to produce goods, recruit townsfolk from the four townsfolk cards at the top of the screen, activate staff that I've acquired and placed into my staff row, which I'll talk about later on, and secure sponsorships from the guilds, and the four guild halls are right here. Another fun part about the game is that we can influence the placement and the arrival of adventurers and boats. So the production phase begins with the turn sequence, which we can see on this clock here. And what we're gonna be doing is taking turns based on the time pieces that are on the clock. And as of right now, we have two time pieces. I am purple and the peddler is this off peach color. I'm gonna go with that. And this one is currently on top, which is the peddler's time piece, which means the peddler is going to start things off. The first thing the peddler is gonna do is flip over the top card from the deck and revealing it, place on the left hand side here we're going to be looking at the center area right here where the bolt is so it's a times one to produce one of the larger goods which is blue so we're going to be taking this good from the supply and we're replacing it on the sale shelf and next we're going to take a look down this row and we see one time is going to be consumed we also have a determination as to what it's going to do manipulation wise around loading the boats uh, which is something we'll see a little bit later on as to which boat it's going to load and we'll talk about it in more detail when when it happens. And the reason it doesn't happen right now is because we're not passing one of these meeples along the outside of the clock. If we happen to be moving the timepiece, which we know we're moving one to here, and this arrow was actually in between, we would then go ahead and load the boats, which I could then show you how that works. It'll be a little bit before we cross this first threshold, but that's it for the peddler. We can now go ahead and clean up the board to end off the turn. Cleaning things up is very easy. We just take the rightmost card, slide it into the discard, and move this card over to the right. Now, Merchant's Cove changes the turn order based on whoever is furthest back on the clock. So when you're done a turn, you're gonna take a look at the clock and figure out which timepiece is furthest back. In this case, it's me. That means I get to go next. There are gonna be times, say for instance, on my turn right now, I only spend one time to do something. My timepiece would sit on top of this other timepiece. It means when I'm done my turn, I get to go again. So when you first are taking a look at the Alchemist board and you're wondering what you're trying to accomplish, it's gonna take a couple rounds of play to get an idea as to the engine you're trying to build to accomplish your goals. But I'll go over the major areas here with you. These are four cauldrons that you can go ahead and start placing ingredients from the decanter inside of. Now you can't just grab them from the decanter, you'll have to go ahead and use your actual Alchemist and place that as an action on one of these three slots. So if I choose the top slot here, it's going to give me a corruption card as well as one time spent. And the arrow means that I'm going to choose a color from this row right here. Now, in this case, I'd only be able to choose red. If I went ahead and decided to go on the second row here, I could choose yellow or blue, and down here I could do red or green. Now where the game gets interesting for the Alchemist is when I'm choosing which row I wanna go after, Icker, which is one of the black ingredients we're gonna see going through here, is basically wild. So what happens is, similar to Potion Explosion, is if I choose a row that actually allows me to select a color I've chosen, so in other words, I could come here and I could select red, but I couldn't select Icker, I'd have to select red. I could take the red and whatever drops down below fills in and whatever lands in that same row, I get to also take of the declared color I've said. Now in this case, picking red would not give me much of anything. What would be smarter to do is to potentially head down to this second line here and call color blue. Now if I do this, I get to not only spend two time, but I grab the blue one that's in here and watch the marbles drop. If Icker lands in the row you've called, you get to take it. And if any more of the color that you've actually declared continues to fall into that row, you basically just keep taking marbles. So in this case, I got four marbles. Now that's a pretty good haul. The average is probably somewhere between two and three, but that was big time. 
All right, so at this point now I have four marbles to drop in and I'm taking a look at what is going on in terms of the customers heading to the shores because I'm trying to come up with a strategy as to which potions I should try to put together in order to get the most points. And really the only way you're gonna understand how the points actually are generated and how you can make the most of what you create, you're going to need to wait until later in this round to start seeing the scoring and how that works. But I will give you a heads up that looking at at the customer's boats and determining who's in there color wise is a big time thing to think about. So what I'm personally looking at here when I have these marbles and I'm deciding how I want to put them in the brewing cauldron is I want to look at the boats based on which side of the Dragon Island in the middle that they're on and also which docks they could potentially go to. So we have three boats during the market phase and we're not in the market phase right now but this is the stuff you need to look ahead and think about. We've got three boats, only two of them can be docked, one of them will disappear and the individuals from that boat that are in there will go to the guild halls and that's a different way to score points later on we'll talk about so you can see we've got three over here so it's very strong on this side likelihood wise we're going to see lots of yellow and you'll also see on each of the piers during the market phase there's different things that are going to be sold here so in this case the individual customers coming to this pier are going to be looking to pick up as many large size potions in my case to purchase the middle pier is going to be focused on the smaller potions and the one on the far right is the black market, which you can sell to, but the downside is you're gonna be taking corruption cards, which will hurt you later in the game. So we have no blue customers on the left-hand side whatsoever of this shore. So that's really not gonna be all that great for me to build large blue potions or even small blue potions. But you can see that this dock being in the middle can have a boat from this side and a boat from this side. And there are some blue over there. So there's a chance one of those could dock over here with the blue customers. So if I built a bunch of smaller blue potions, those actually might be what I should go after right now. Now, again, things can change in the boats as we go through the gameplay more customers are going to load into the boats and more will be revealed as we go which is going to continually change your strategy as to which things you're creating to meet the need and the demand of the customers landing at each of these piers so heading back to the alchemist board here, these are the three things you should keep your eye on when trying to place ingredients into these different cauldrons. You're free to place them in as you choose. Uh, the one thing to note though, is that if you get too many of these Icar ingredients into these cauldrons, they're going to explode, bad things are going to happen. That's gonna have the toxic waste cauldron get filled up, which is gonna eventually result in you taking a whole bunch of corruption. Now also it's worth noting, if you place Icar into one of these brewing cauldrons, and let's say hypothetically I wanted to go ahead and create this potion right here which is a small blue potion all it states is that I need two equal ingredients these two are considered equal because the black one is wild it could also be two blue However, if in the future I choose to go ahead and brew this, then what would happen is the ichor, because it was spent, would actually go into the toxic waste cauldron, and this blue one would go back into the alchemist bag. So there's some things to think about there in terms of how this is filling up, but there are ways to mitigate this thing as well as clear out this nasty area. So continuing along the row here, as we already know, two identical ingredients will create a small good. And this one allows two identical ingredients of the same color and then anything else. It could be the same color, it could be a wild, it could be a different color, will create a larger good, which is definitely nice because those ones will score you even more points. Uh, a little tougher to pull off as it's only sellable at the pier on the far left hand side or the black market. And finally, this one right here is three of any ingredients inside a brewing cauldron when you take a brewing action you then remove all those ingredients and deal with them as per the rule book then this ichor extract is going to come out of this area and drop down populating one of the spaces and opening up a guild sponsorship in the corresponding color now it's worth noting once you have these ichor extracts sitting inside of one of the brewing cauldrons, you also have these ichor ingredients and they can be placed in the same area, but they both have to copy an existing color to be used as a wild. They can't on their own just create a good. So let's rewind the tape back to me placing my ingredients in the brewing cauldrons. So I've gone ahead and done this. Now my logic here in placing them in this fashion is that based on what I've got over here, 
here in the future as an action if I choose to go here and brew, and there's other ways to make this brew happen I'll talk about later on, then we can go ahead and brew and actually create a good that goes on my sale shelf and is ready to go for customers that come into shore. Now the reason I split these all the way across and didn't do something like this is I want to be able to have flexibility. So what does that mean and how does that work? Well, think about it like this. If I happen to pull more ingredients from the decanter in the future, which is a very likely thing to happen, you're going to grab a bunch of ingredients and when I'm placing them into these other cauldrons, I could, for instance, in the future, let's say I had a red come down hypothetically and I placed it here. And then let's say hypothetically, I also got an icker and I placed it like this. Having something like this inside one of the brewing cauldrons is really handy. It gives the most versatility to creating a good because I can go ahead and either spend it for what I'm trying to create. So for instance, if I wanted to create a red small potion, I would spend these two leaving the blue one inside. If I wanted to go with a larger good, I could do that with all three of these, or I could do this spending all three in order to bring down the ichor extract. By setting them up like this, you have the most versatility rather than jumbling them all together. And that versatility really comes down to the fact of the colors. Again, I don't know enough of what's coming in customer wise to start creating potions that I think are going to bank me the most points. So by setting myself up in this kind of a fashion in the future, it would allow me to go after red goods or blue goods from the same cauldron. The last thing I'm going to go ahead and do once all the ingredients are placed is I'm going to take my alchemist bag, give it a nice little shuffle there, and we're going to drop some new ingredients down into the decay decanter one at a time. So we let the decanter do the rolling and look at that. We've set ourselves up with some pretty good yellow there. That's going to work out nicely. Now, what isn't nice is the fact that my action I just currently took puts me in the position that I would love to take later on. And it's worth noting if your individual is sitting in a space, the next time it comes around in my turn, I can't take that exact same action. I'll have to move elsewhere and then come back. I miss placing one more ingredient into the decanter, so let's do that right now. And oh my gosh, that's gonna be a crazy turn. And now to finish off my turn, I know the action I took took two time. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my timepiece and go one and two. And as you can see, the load the boat action will not be happening on my turn because I did not cross one of these locations. It's also worth noting, you'll see here when playing solo, you're placing these two tokens over top of these to really boost up how many of the customers are gonna be loading onto the boats as it gets closer to the market phase, which is going to end out things. Back to the peddler, we'll flip over a card here and we have a times one of a green good which is going to end up on the sale shelf another time slipping by as well so the timepiece will move one it lands on top of where mine is it doesn't trigger the load the boats but guess what the peddler gets to go again we'll go ahead and clean up from that last round so we'll place this in the discard we'll move this card over and flip a new one and see what happens oh my that is a lot so two times a regular sized or smaller good is going to place two more in here so this uh, ai is currently pumping stuff out but that's going to cost two time Heading back here, we'll see the timepiece is going to move one and two, and it does pass the load, the boats. So that is going to occur right now. And we're going to use the AI cards that are in the center to determine how the boats are loaded. How this occurs with the peddler is you'll take a look at the goods the peddler has produced on the far right hand side of the sale shelf. So you go all the way down to the far right hand side and it's a blue one. So then you take a look through the row here of meeples that it has and it does have a blue meeple. So this is the customer we'll be placing. So where will we be placing this customer? Well, this is where we look at these two cards here in the middle. You can see on this icon right here, it's showing that the left-hand side of the piers is where our focus should be. And then these arrows are pointing towards the middle, which means closest to the middle of the game board. So taking a look at our boats right now, we remember it's on the left-hand side. So it's the left three boats we're looking at right now, but it's closest to the center, which is essentially Dragon Island. So that is going to be this boat right here. 
So in the end, we actually did get some blue going on over here on the left-hand side. It's also worth mentioning during the load the boat's action, whether it's the peddler or myself going, if we happen to fill one of these boats, we then go ahead and dock the boat at the pier. Now, if it's me and that boat, let's say that I'm placing a particular customer in the back end of that one on my turn and it fills it up, I get a choice of placing it here or here based on the colors inside, what I have for goods produced, as well as what I'm trying to score the most on. If it's the peddler, the peddler is going to use the same AI cards that we just used to determine where the customer goes to determine where the boat will actually dock as well. So hypothetically, if that blue customer I just placed in that boat here, right there, was actually the last slot filled, then based on the AI card, it would actually move to this location and all those meeples would drop on the pier here. But we'll see this later as we go along. I've gone ahead and cleaned up the peddler's board and the cards there and moved things to the discard pile. So now it is back to us and we have a few actions to spend and we are going to be pushing past the load the boat action ourselves really soon. Now for this upcoming turn, as much as I would love to go ahead and replace my figure here to grab the yellows and be able to grab another yellow when it falls, another icker and another icker, it would be five marbles, which I can tell you right now based on my prior plays, did not happen. That's very rare that you get that kind of layout, uh, but that would be huge knowing there's so many yellow customers on the left-hand side that could potentially land in the large goods pier, which would be huge for me if I can create a bunch of them. Them. So maybe some of those yellows will end up down in here and we can, like I said, have that versatility to change things up from blue to yellow, really giving us a leg up out of the gates. So let's do something else instead this turn. Let's go ahead and place my individual here. And this is going to allow me to gain a townsfolk. And I'll have to pay, it's a question mark on the time, based on what's underneath each of the cards here. So taking a look at them, if I was to take this individual, not only am I getting a guild icon on here, which is going to help me in the final scoring phase, which we'll talk about much later on. Some of these also have corruption attached to them because they're so good. There's also a negative uh, connection to them as well so some of them kind of have a mix of a positive and negative but the one thing that's cool about taking a townsfolk card is not only do you get the ability that's on the card at the bottom by paying whatever the cost is under the card so in this case we got some yellow in there that could be hugely helpful maybe this large good right here is the one i should go for probably is and i think actually i'll do that so let's take this one knowing that we have three yellow over here and i'm gonna gun and hope that the boat on the far left ends up right here and we'll try to put more yellow in there or at least more rogues based on my rogue card down here where I can change uh, a rogue out for a different color of my choosing by gaining a corruption that could be a big time way to score some points now I take this townsfolk card and I get to slot it into one of these four positions now it's really important not to miss this because if you do not take advantage of the ability on the bottom of the card when you gain the townsfolk, you lose it because once you place it on this board, this is going to be hidden underneath whatever ability you've slotted it under for. So you can't get it again after that. So don't forget about it. So in this case, I get a large yellow good, which I'm going to place on my sale shelf for later on. You can see it's worth eight points. Blue and yellow is eight for the large goods and red and green are six. And then again, it scales in a similar fashion for the lower kids uh, yellow and blue are still the best to create but it's worth noting inside of the draw bag here that there are less blue and yellow customers than red and green so with our recruited townsfolk we now have to slot it into the staff board and this staff board is going to be something that we can trigger as an action when we want to on our alchemist board it sits actually just below where we currently are and it costs two time it's just off screen but basically the more of these townsfolk that we acquire from the middle of the game board and slot into each of these when we trigger this action in the future it's going to allow us to do all of the things we have a townsfolk attached to meaning our staff are going to be working for us to really provide a lot of variation and variability around what we can do on a given turn if we choose to place this townsfolk individual in the scrubber location, then that individual is going to allow us to return up to two ingredients from any cauldrons to the alchemy bag, which is a really
really handy if we want to change things up or we don't like how we've situated things, which is why it's called the scrubber. The forager, which is the one right beside it here, allows us to take one ingredient either from the decanter itself without the trickle down effect or any cauldron and place it in any vacant brewing cauldron space. Another very handy ability. This one right here is pretty straightforward. It allows us to take the brew action in up to two brewing cauldrons, which is quite nice. And then the final one over here is really handy because it's going to allow us to go ahead and choose and discard one corruption card that we have in our supply and get rid of it. Again, whatever corruption cards we have in our supply by the end of the game are going to seriously negatively affect our scoring in gold when we do our final scoring. I've gone ahead and placed our new townsfolk individual into our staff board with the removal of corruption ability. This is going to come in handy later on. You also don't want to forget to go ahead and shuffle everything over to the right that's currently in here and repopulate this position. That action cost me two times, so I'm gonna go ahead and go one, two, we're on top, and we also have to load the boats. Now this is where we go ahead and grab the draw bag, and for us, we're gonna pull one out without looking, of course, and we get to slot it into any boat we wish. So this is a way we can manipulate the customers that are coming in, and guess what I pulled out? A blue. That is awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead, oh, this is a tough call. Should I do... Well, you know what? The, it's actually not a tough call. I'm just gonna go ahead and slot this in right here and I'm gonna bring this boat to shore. So we're gonna move this boat right in here and because the boat is full, that's why we're moving in. I get a choice as to which of these two piers I put it on. I'm happy to place it here because I know I'm trying to make some smaller goods. And I've got that uh, rogue in there. I can potentially convert to blue as well, making it a total of three blue in there. I'm pretty sure you guys know exactly what I want to do on this turn, and that is to get as many of these yellow knickers as I can. So I'm going to go ahead and move my alchemist over here to the middle row for two time. That means I'm going to declare yellow as my color. Now, it does matter which one of these I pull first. And then when I declare yellow, I have to pull yellow. And if I was to pull this one first, I'd actually be shooting myself in the foot because if I take it, the red will fall down, the black ichor will fall to here. And if red's here, I'll never see that ichor, or at least that one ichor. So what I'd rather do is pull everything from this row so if I can go like this and grab yellow that drops in down to there and then this one pulls and of course it just got stuck on the ledge but this is icker that I get to keep now as well so it ends up being all of this so this is really interesting because again, I'm not too sure whether it's gonna be better to go hard on blue and create a whole bunch of blue smaller potions for that middle pier or to change to yellow at the larger potions. So what I'm gonna do is what I talked about earlier on where I'm gonna to try to make these cauldrons versatile by allowing for either or. And just like that, we've placed our ingredients and I'm gonna go ahead to the alchemist bag right now. We're gonna draw some more, which you're gonna drop into the decanter. What do we got here? Okay, that is a lot of green. Wow, okay, that's a lot of green. That ends up costing me two times. It's gonna place me here on six and another one here to seven. Now you're probably wondering what these uh, mouse icons are for. Basically in later rounds in the game, uh, these mice are gonna to move to this one position. This other one will move here and it's gonna open up the availability for you to gain an extra hour at the cost of taking a corruption card. And uh, of course we won't be seeing that in this overview video, but this opens up some more options in the later rounds. We have gone ahead and passed the load the boats action, so let's go ahead and do that and hope, cross our fingers for more yellow or blue. Let's go ahead and draw from the bag. I'm gonna shake this thing up so we have no idea what's inside. Let's reach in there and grab something. We got ourselves red, so that's not exactly the one I was hoping to get, but guess what? Not only are you trying, of course, to load the boats to manipulate them so that they're gonna help you out to get you more gold, but you can place these meeples you pull from the bag to fill up boats, to dock at piers, to actually mess over the AI opponent in this case, because as we know right now, the peddler has blue goods and green goods to sell so a red one is a good one to throw in a boat to try and progress something that's going to dock off a bunch of customers that they well, basically the peddler doesn't have anything for I've gone ahead and added the red customer to the middle boat on the right side. So now there's a yellow and two reds. That is a boat full of customers that the peddler cannot satisfy. And I would love to be able to place that maybe at the black market or something like that, just to kind of mess up plans that the peddler may have. But of course, anything could change here very soon. 
The peddler is further behind than us. Let's go ahead and pull a card off the top. It is a times one to this symbol right here, which means take a look at the faction icon or guild icon in the middle, which is red. It means for however many guild hall members of that color are currently in the guild house. So it's red and we currently only have one individual in there. Actually, the guild houses all just have one at this point in the game. For every one of them, the peddler's gonna gain two gold. So just a straight two gold. So two gold going to the peddler. We'll take the score marker here, move it up to the two position. And the amount of time on the AI card was one. So it's the time piece is gonna move right here, which means we are loading the boats for one. Taking a look at the peddler, we have blue as the furthest right good, but no blue along the bottom here. So we move to the next color down the row. It's green, we do have green. So we'll go ahead and take a green meeple and place it based on this right here, which says it'll be on the left-hand side closest to Dragon Island. So that will end up placing this meeple in with the red and the rogue. The peddler is still currently behind my timepiece, so the peddler gets to go again, drawing a card from the top here, and oh, looks like we have a hard card now. This is a times one, and it's gonna be a production of one of these yellow goods, so they do actually have some yellow going now, and there is one time being consumed. On the track, that'll be a movement of this timepiece to here, no loading of the boats, but it is on top of mine, so they get to go again. Let's see what the peddler is doing this time, and it's a times one to a yellow and a green. Oh my, okay, so this is really starting to fill up pretty good at this point. Another time is taken. That's going to jump this timepiece over to here and another load the boats action. The furthest good is green and there is a green customer right here, so this is the one we'll be placing. And this time it's going to be middle right. Now, just to clear up any questions around when you have a situation with no customers down here that match in color to the rightmost good as you go down the line. So if, for instance, we were looking for a green and we have no green, looking for a yellow, no yellow, looking for a blue, no blue, and all the rest are the same. So basically nothing there. Then you'd next look for a rogue in this line, which we currently don't have. And the next thing you do is the AI would just simply go right to the draw bag, just like I would, and draw one out at random and place it based on its AI cards. All right, I'm gonna go ahead right now and we're gonna grab the green one. I think I'm gonna go down to here to grab this green one because I'm gonna get four greens off this and that sounds pretty good to me. So we'll take one, two, three and four. Just like that, I've gone ahead and populated all of my brewing cauldrons at this point. Everything's full, so we really need to brew next, and I've already filled up my decanter. Time is going to continue to tick away for me, and I pass a load the boat's action, so I'm going to have to do that. Let's go ahead and draw from the bag and see how this goes. All right, we got ourselves a green one this time. Interesting. So we do have the ability to pull off the creation of some decent greens, so that could be worthwhile. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, oh, this is really tough. I think what I'm gonna do is because I really want to ensure that this yellow boat gets to the dock, I'm gonna actually fill this boat with a green one, even though I'd rather have yellow in there because I'm a little worried that the other one could get filled a little quicker and I may never get these yellow guys to this location. Heading back over to the peddler who is behind me on the timepiece side of things is gonna gain a large green good, oh my gosh. Okay, so one of those two time though for this one and that is going to push the peddler past a loads the boats action which is actually gonna have us placing two meeples. So two time at this point is going to be one and two. And as you can see, we're gonna to have to go ahead and resolve that. Now we already know we're drawing from the bag because I talked about it before. There's only one red customer on the peddler board and there's no red goods on the sale shelf for the peddler. So we are gonna to go to the draw bag here and be drawing two. So the first one coming out of the gates and again, following the rules from the ad card, it's gonna be on the right hand side the f on the furthest outside. So basically right side and far right. So let's see what we get. We have a red and lastly we have a rogue. Based on the AI card, I've gone ahead and placed the red and the rogue in the far right hand side. And also because that boat is now full, it is going to dock on the right hand side at the far side, which is where the black market is. So it's gonna come in like so, and all these meeples are gonna hop out.
It's worth mentioning that when all pier spaces are filled, which is all four of them that are marked in the water area, the end of the round, which is the production phase, is signaled, and we're going to move some things on the clock in regards to the market phase indicator, and then we're going to move our timepieces a couple extra spaces until we're either on top of the market indicator or past it, and that will end off the production phase and we'll move into the market phase. So we're getting very close to that because we have have four boats still in the water, two spaces available, and each of those boats out in the water right now have three meeples apiece. It's not going to take much to finish them off, and you can see we're running into draws of two each at this point. All right, let's go ahead and do some brewing. We're going to go ahead and take our character here, the alchemist, place it here. It'll cost one time, and we can now create something with each of these cauldrons, one recipe apiece. Overall, looking at the boats that are coming in, there's just not enough green to justify creating a potion to sell later on. So what I'm going to do, and even just to keep, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to actually brew right now uh, the ability to get the ichor extract. So I'm going to basically take all three of these. So I'm doing this one right here, any three ingredients to bring this down to this position. So now I kind of have a wild there making things easier later on. These now go into the bag because they're all legitimate colored ingredients that will go inside. If I had happened to have spent an ichor, like one of these ones, the ingredients, it would go into this toxic area or toxic cauldron to the side. Now, taking a look at what I have in my brewing cauldrons right now, even though I would love to create a whole bunch of the yellow ones, I can't because I already have one yellow one created. There's only one more large one I can. So I might do one yellow large potion and one blue large potion. So let's do that. We're going to go ahead and take these two marbles. They'll go back in. Because I use this uh, ichor ingredient, it's going to go into the toxic cauldron here. These two are going to go back into the bag. And this one is going to go into the cauldron as well. And that's going to create for me a blue and a yellow. So this works out pretty good because I still want to get a small blue potion created for that middle pier that has a bunch of blue there. So I'm going to go ahead and use these two as the identical color of blue in order to create a small blue. And anything I don't use stays in the cauldron. This one was spent, this ichor ingredient, so it goes in there and thankfully doesn't start filling up the top row so I don't get any kind of cards for corruption. And this blue goes back inside the bag and that is going to net me one small blue potion on the sale. Taking a look at my timepiece, that is going to put me on top of the other one, but past a threshold here, we have to pull two meeples from the bag. Let's go ahead and shake them up and see what we get here. This is prompt, well, this is guaranteed to end the round because everything at this point is at the back of boats. So the first one I have to place is a red one, and the second one, come on, yellow. Oh, I got the yellow, yes! Okay, this is awesome. Now, it's worth mentioning that when you're drawing from the bag and you're drawing two, you're supposed to draw the first one like a did red and place it in the boat first and then draw the second one. Although I really wanted to show you guys that I was drawing those two back to back without any messing around with the bag and I still got that yellow. Now regardless I would have not placed this red one in that yellow boat yet because I would have wanted to see what that last meeple would have been. It just ended up being yellow which is perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and place this red one and I need to think about what I want at this middle pier out of the two boats on the right. It was a pretty easy decision. I wanted to bolster how many blue are in the middle here. So I've gone ahead and docked this ship, placed the red at the back. They're all going to come out now. So this middle uh, tier, or I should say pier, usually ends up having quite a bit of customers coming to it. The next thing that happens immediately, once you've filled the right-hand side or the left-hand side of the game board with boats, is the other boat that cannot and no longer can dock anywhere is then taken out of play, but all of the individuals that are inside of it then go inside of the guild halls. This is going to be where sponsorships and things like that on these townsfolk cards and everything else are going to start multiplying against how many individuals are in these guild halls later on for point scoring that is seriously going to help you out or it's going to uh, be a pain for you if uh, the peddler actually gets to take a lot of advantage of that. So that is how we resolve those but now we have one more yellow to place. We're going to go ahead and place it in this boat right here. I'm definitely docking this one. This is so awesome. I got two big eight goods to drop in here. Three customers that wanted a green one. This final boat will be removed and these individuals will go to their guild halls as well. 
Now that all the pier spaces are filled, the end of the round is signaled for the production phase. We now place the market phase indicator on the hour space that's directly after the furthest forward time pieces on the clock. And as of right now, that is going to be 11. So this is going to land right here. What ends up happening from this point forward is there's no more loading of the boats. It doesn't matter if we go past any of these other ones. That's not going to happen because there's no more boats to load. But we are going to continue going turn by turn with without doing loading the boats until both of the timepieces are either on top of the marketing phase token or past it. My timepiece is on top, so I get to go next. And no matter what I do here, it's gonna be at least one time, which is gonna put me on top of the market phase. And that's certainly going to uh, end off my turn. Then the peddler will go and that will end things off. So we're gonna go ahead right now, I think, and just prepare for the future with the crew over here. So let's go back up to this area here and we'll see which of the crew members I wanna go after. Now looking at them, there's a whole bunch that actually have the exact same triggered ability that you get the second you actually acquire it based on spending from below. So it might seem like there's not much going on here, but there is guild seals up top that could matter based on how many are in each one. So right now red would be a really good one as there are four individuals in the red guild hall, but there's no red up there. So next best would be green or yellow. So you keep those kind of things in mind as you're recruiting uh, your townsfolk. So for me, honestly, I think the one that makes the most sense is going to be this one plus I don't have to take any corruption for it. After recruiting this townsfolk I'm going to get a small yellow potion added to my pile here and I'm going to slot this individual I think under this one here which is going to help me deal with some of the nasty ichor in my toxic cauldron. That's going to move my timepiece a total of two spaces so one two and again completely ignoring the fact we went over the load the boats action now it goes to the peddler. Heading over to the Peddler, we'll pull off the next card and we have a times one onto the large good. But as you can see on the sale shelf, no space whatsoever. So when that occurs, we go to the draw bag and we're gonna pull out one adventure from here and it's gonna end up down below. So you'll see how this works for scoring in a little bit. We got a green one. With one time spent, that's going to move the timepiece on top of the market phase indicator. And at this point, the production phase is complete. At this point, we now move all the timepieces that advance beyond the market phase indicator, which is mine, to the top of it, preserving the order. Now we enter the market phase where we begin to sell our goods. Now the key thing here when selling your goods is that I can sell as many goods as I want to during each market phase at the three piers. So in other words, I don't have to go ahead and sell everything that's on my sales shelf, but in order to get some points and also free up the ability to create more of these potions as there's not an unlimited supply as we saw with the larger potions, I'm gonna want to clear some of them out. And I mean, there's a good reason to with this first pier right here we're starting with. So starting with myself, we're gonna go ahead and sell one of these at eight, and that is going to be eight times the number of meeples that are interested in this particular good. So eight and 16 and 24 for just this one right here, and another 24 for this one for a total of 48. These are now returned back to the supply, and you'll see that my marker is now on 48, way up there at the very top. Now at this first pier, there are no blue customers, so I cannot sell this one. We'll move to the next pier here in the middle where there's a lot of action going on. And you can see there's a rogue in there. And my plan with the rogue was to actually take a corruption based on this rogue card right here, allowing me to change the rogue into a color of my choosing. I'm gonna choose to have it be blue. So I'll have a total of four in there. I do have to draw a corruption card, which I'll hold on to and hopefully be able to remove with this ability in a future day. So this small blue potion for four, with four blue here and the rogue being another blue is going to give me a total of 16 points so we'll go ahead and place that back in the reserve we're going to jump from 48 up to 64. Now I do still have one small yellow potion remaining there is one yellow individual at the middle pier I could sell it for four points but honestly I'd rather keep it and try to actually make that multiplier a bit better the next time around. It's also worth mentioning that when you're playing solo, you can go ahead and resolve from left to right through the piers in order to sell your goods before the peddler goes. Now in this case, I'm going first because my timepiece is on top and the peddler's is underneath. Now if I was playing against other players, how this is actually resolved is still based on the timepiece in terms of who's going first, but it's done fully peer by peer. So in other words, you take a look at peer number one, you look at the timepieces, it would be me, 
and then if I had a second player, human player, playing against me, they would resolve all their peer number one next, and then we would collectively move to peer two and go down the row. This is because, strategically, you might be keeping an eye on what the other player is doing in terms of what they're spending or selling their goods against, and keeping track of how the score is going. In my case, because I am just strategizing against the AI, and the AI is basically just trying to sell absolutely everything it has goods-wise, I can just go ahead and resolve all mine first. Now, last but not least, we come to the black market peer on the far right hand side. And again, if I want to, which I'm actually kind of tempted to do, I could take another corruption to change the rogue that's there to a blue, which allow me to sell this large blue at that location. Now, the downside is just selling at that peer in general gives me corruption. So it would be a double hit of corruption, giving me a total of three corruption cards going into the next round. I don't really want to do that. I don't think, although there are a lot of cards out here that can instantly get rid of three corruption, so it might actually be worth my while to do it. So, what the heck, let's go ahead and do it. So I'm going to go ahead and sell this over here. We're going to take two corruption cards, one to go ahead and convert this rogue. You'll see that some corruption cards actually give you multiple points of corruption at the end of the game, but can also give you guild, hull, seals, as well as sponsorships. So there's one and the next one coming off the top just for selling at the black market is just a single one so this is my current layout in terms of corruption cards at the moment and again i could try to acquire a townsfolk card in the future to get rid of these three before the end of the game and final scoring happens but now i can sell this eight for 16 total now that I've resolved all of the goods that I want to sell across the piers to the customers, I can take a look to see if I have any open guild sponsorships. And I actually do because I went ahead and got that Icker extract pulled down in the yellow guild, which means I now gain two additional points, a total of 82. Now let's go ahead and sell the goods for the peddler. And the peddlers handle differently. It resolves sales from each peer left to right, although that's similar. But this is where it's different. The peddler always makes a sale at the first opportunity, even if the black market peer offers a better price overall. And the peddler will draw exactly one corruption card after selling any number of goods at the black market peer. So they also can take corruption too, which can negatively affect their score later on. So let's go ahead and start selling some goods now we take a look over here does the peddler have anything that's yellow or green that's large in terms of goods Yes, indeed. It has one that is listed at six points. So that's going to move the tracker from two up to eight Next up, we'll take a look at the smaller goods here. There are three blue here for the peddler, and the peddler actually does have two of these particular goods to sell. So this is actually going to be pretty good. So four times three is 12, four times three is 12, so 24 for these two. The peddler has two small goods here at four apiece. There's only one yellow, so that's a total of eight. Next, two small green goods. There's only one green customer, so a total of six. And the last good that the peddler has is a large blue good, which couldn't be sold at the original first pier. So it has to be sold at the black market for just eight as there's only one customer there and a corruption card is drawn and given to the peddler. The sale shelf for the peddler is completely emptied out, but there are a couple of customers down below here. Now we move for the peddler to the market phase sponsorships. And as you can see, we have a green and a red. So we take a look at the guild halls for both of those. And that's how many points are given to the peddler. Peddler is currently at 54 and you can see there's four in here, two in here. So a total of six more bringing the peddler to a total of 60. So overall, not too bad. I've actually got a decent lead on the peddler right now. I'm just over 80. Peddler's at 60. So I've got about a 22 point lead, which is pretty good. But that can change pretty drastically in the coming days. There's two more to go. Now, at this point, we move into the final phase of the day, which is the cleanup phase. We shuffle all the cards on the peddler shop board, which is the deck, the active cards, and the discard cards into a deck and place it face down in the deck designated area so everything's being reshuffled back together to create that deck 
And that's it for cleanup. In terms of the peddler, it's worth mentioning when we move into the second day, which won't be happening during this video, but during your play, you'll certainly see it. You'll have some customers still remaining in these four first slots at the very beginning of the board. And when you get to the arrival phase and it tells you to flip over a card into the rightmost slot, as well as populating these four slots right here, you simply leave the ones that are already there and you draw enough customers to populate the empty spaces. The cleanup phase for the main board is pretty straightforward. All of these character meeples, including the rogues, are all going to go back to the bag. So they'll be dropped back in here. All the boats will be placed back out into the ocean empty. Next, you're going to refresh the townsfolk, which is quite simple. You'll take the far right one and you're going to discard it, placing it at the bottom of the deck. Every other card that's in this row, like normal, even when you recruit one, is going to shuffle to the right and then you draw a new one, which will be placed in the left-hand slot. Finally, we move to the clock. And after round number one, you're going to move the mouse from the first clock hand to the number one space. Then you're going to take all the time pieces that are in a stack without changing their order, and you're going to place it on the lowest number that is after that mouse. So in this case, it's going to be a two, like so. Last but not least, you're going to take the market phase indicator and move it to the 12 position. So after the first two rounds or days, a mouse is going to be moved from each of the hands on the clock, opening up the ability for you to basically gain an hour of time at the cost of corruption if you need it. It's important to note that the peddler will also make use of this additional hour based on how many different goods it has created on its sale shelf. You'll see indications right here as to whether it will use the hands on the clock or not. So in other words, if goods have been produced up to this space here, it will make use of the hands and take that time and corruption. But if it's past this point, it will not. Now at this point, you have seen a full day. There's another full day to come and another full day to come after that in order to complete the play and at that point final scoring will happen after round three when all players reveal their corruption cards that includes the peddler and yourself and receive final scoring sponsorship so for each faction on a townsfolk or corruption card you're going to gain gold equal to the number of adventures in the matching faction hall and for each corruption icon on a townsfolk or corruption card you're going to lose gold equal to the number of adventures in the lair. The player with the most gold is obviously going to win, and if there's a tie, the tied player with the most unsold golds left on their sale shelf wins. If it's still tied, the tied player with the fewest corruption cards wins, and if still tied, victory is shared among the tied players, or in this case, the AI and the solo player. That is going to wrap up the game overview for Merchant's Cove, giving you everything you need to get this game to the table and get playing. The other thing I want to talk about to wrap up this video is all around the secret stash. Now I'm going to link to the actual unboxing that I did, which includes all the contents from the secret stash, but I'd like to get that box to the table here and talk about what it adds for solo players. Here is a look at all of the game components that come inside the Secret Stash expansion. It's going to be a treasure trove of goodies that can be added into the base game. It features a variety of modular expansions that you can mix and match at your choosing to create fresh experiences each time you play. Plus, and this is one of the major reasons why I wanted to highlight this expansion, it introduces new content for playing specifically Solo, which is a book of 12 thematically driven scenarios and a deck of solo challenge cards. You'll see that booklet in the top right hand corner. In terms of all the components that come inside the box, here you have the Dragon Isle Festival tile, four halls of plenty tiles, including one layer of villainy tile, five faction leader meeples, and eight gray rogue goods three new 3D cardboard boats, and you'll notice you've got different sizes in terms of the slots for these boats. The two on the outside are both five-seater boats. Remember, in the core game, they're only four, and you have a smaller boat in the middle with just two slots. Eight boat setup cards. 11 new rogue cards, which will certainly add to the variety inside the game. 12 new corruption cards. 48 new townsfolk cards. 12 solo challenge cards, 
A rule book which encompasses everything here in terms of the different components you can mix and match as well as a specific solo scenario book which is 36 pages in length and includes 12 scenarios. Those are all the components you can expect to find inside of Merchant's Cove, the secret stash. There's probably a number of you wanting to see the front side of all these card decks. For those that want to see that, you can check out my recently released Merchant's Cove unboxing, which not only checks out the core box fully, but also checks out this secret stash expansion. And of course, now that you've seen some gameplay, you'll be able to make connections better as to how these cards are going to impact the gameplay if you start mixing and matching them in. At this point, let's focus on a major addition inside this expansion and that is the solo scenarios booklet on the front of the booklet you'll see a table of contents it lists out all 12 scenarios you'll notice that the final three something fishy benefactor and invasion are linked together Inside of each scenario, you're not only going to have some narrative, you're going to have new setup instructions. It's going to specifically tell you which modular additions from the secret stash you're supposed to add into the core experiences and what changes to make during each of the phases in the game. Thanks to the variability within this expansion, you're going to experience some very different scenarios as you go through this booklet. Now this is just a look at a couple of the scenarios you can expect to find inside of here, but we're also going to take a look at some of the final ones that are actually linked together, as I believe that those ones are going to be of quite a high interest to the community. Towards the end of the book, you're going to find chapter one of three, starting at something fishy here. You'll have your setup. It's a whodunit situation. And then you move into your production phase and so on. And you'll see, depending on your success uh, through the campaign, different things are going to happen. Now, I'm not going to flip through everything to spoil that, but you can see for the first one here, success, if you won, is going to be about noting your score compared to the peddler, proceeding to the benefactor chapter two, using the exact same merchant. But if you lost, the campaign's over. Over and you must try again. And that's going to essentially wrap up a look at this secret stash expansion and what it can add into Merchant's Cove. Now, for solo players, in conclusion, I want to say that if you're picking up Merchant's Cove, just the core experience by yourself, you're going to find an okay experience. In other words, it's not great and it's not bad. It's just okay. It's good. You're going to be going up against the peddler and it's a decent challenge, but at some point you are going to progress past that peddler in the base game and what cards it has against you you'll go through the rogue cards that are in there quite quickly so for solo play i highly highly recommend as i've mentioned before that you pick up the secret stash as this is what really tips the scales for solo players to check it out and because there is that specific focus on solo play i highly recommend this one that's going to conclude this game overview for Merchant's Cove. Really enjoyed showing you guys this one, getting it to the table, showing you in action, going over all the components you can expect to see. Now, some of the stuff you didn't see in this video would be the three other types of merchants in the base game that you can choose from. I highly recommend going to the rule book itself online and checking them out for yourself. They're actually quite interesting and unique. And one of the things that makes Merchant's Cove so cool is that basically each merchant that you play, you're playing your own mini game. That's essentially what's really going on there behind the scenes and they all play differently with the same end goal of trying to produce goods though in order to sell them. But that really makes it feel like a town that's putting together products to meet the needs of customers as they come in. And it's also worth mentioning there's three other expansions you can pick up to add even more in terms of options for merchants to play. And again, each of them are completely unique. I really hope that this game overview gives you a great idea as to whether or not Merchant's Cove is for you or not. Let me know if this video helped you out one way or the other by leaving a like. Let me know in the comments below if you're already playing Merchant's Cove solo, how do you like it so far? Or do you have the Secret Stash expansion mixed in? Are you moving through those solo scenarios or are you just enjoying the core experience on its own? If you don't like what you've seen, let me know. What aspects of the gameplay are you not a fan of? I would love to hear thoughts on both sides. Thank you guys so much for watching and as always keep on rolling solo.